welcome. March 10th, the Cutting Edge Lecture in Science from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. McGill is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe Nations. McGill has long respected, honored, and acknowledged these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters where we work, where we play, where we learn from each other, where we teach and exchange information. Quelques mots en français pour dire que l'Université McGill se trouve sur un territoire qui a pendant longtemps servi de site de rencontre et d'échange parmi les nations autochtones, incluant les nations Haudenosaunee et Anishinaabe. Et nous désirons exprimer notre reconnaissance envers ces nations dont la présence marque ce territoire et qui peut aujourd'hui être un lieu de rassemblement pour des gens provenant des quatre coins du monde. Our speaker this evening will be introduced by our student ambassadors, Natalia Kolinsnikov and Jenny Park. Dr. Sarah Moser is a professor in the Department of Geography at McGill and has expertise in three different areas within geography, urban geography, critical planning, and cultural geography. In her work, she has a focus on religious and national identity building and how this intersects with urban planning and development. She has written articles analyzing these themes in a wide range of countries, with a specific emphasis on, the, on Southeast Asia and the Gulf countries in the Middle East. Her international range is reflected in her education, as she does her undergraduate degree at the University of Victoria, and then her PhD at the National University of Singapore, and was a postdoctoral fellow at both MIT and Trinity College. She narrowed her field of research largely through traveling and collaborating with other scholars and students, and has re received a grant in 2021 to work specifically on the topic of reducing fundamentalism through speculative urbanism in the Gulf. Specifically, countries such as the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar in relation to new smart cities. This will be the topic of today's presentation, followed by a Q&A session. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Moser. Thanks very much for the introduction, Jenny and Natalia. And thanks to Ingrid for all the energy you put into uh, organizing the Cutting Edge series. Um, I'm very happy to share some of my research. It's very preliminary because I just got the grant and I have two more years to work on this project. <laughs> um, and in light of McGill's 20th anniversary, I've been encouraged to reflect on what this time span of 200 years means for my research on Gulf urbanism. Uh, and I realize my research is best explained in a broad historical context that connects cultural and religious conditions of the past with the challenges of the present and what sorts of futures Gulf states are imagining for themselves. Uh, increasingly ambitious and fantastical urban mega developments have been announced with regularity in the Gulf Cooperation Council or GCC states. Uh, which are Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. These include new smart cities built from scratch, futuristic techno-utopian enclaves, and massive artificial islands in the shape of fish, palm fronds, and continents. Kuwait is building 12 new cities, Saudi Arabia is building six, while Oman, Qatar, and Bahrain are building several each. Uh, in January 2021, Saudi Arabia announced a new smart city for 1 million people designed in a 170 kilometer long linear city with no cars, no streets, and no carbon emissions. The media and scholarship have uh, focused on the spectacular scale and ambitions of Gulf projects, the challenges in their green and smart experiments, and their role in transitioning economies away from oil, with overwhelming focus on projects in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Qatar. While GCC countries are all monarchies with theocratic elements, scholars have largely overlooked the role that religion plays in these urban mega developments. The small body of scholarship on how new master plan cities or new districts engage with Islam focuses on how religio nationalism and Islamism are manifested in the built environment. This research project that I have two years to work on. 
um, proposes to investigate the opposite. So how highly speculative and futuristic urban mega developments are being crafted in part to carve out space within conservative Muslim societies for more moderate practices of Islam as a way to combat fundamentalism. In an era in which Gulf countries are urgently attempting to diversify their economies and attract international business investment, fundamentalist Islam is increasingly discussed openly as bad for business. In recent years, powerful national figures in Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain have made public statements about the urgent need to foster more moderate interpretations of Islam to help liberalize the economy. Now, I have organized this presentation into five sections. Um, first, I'll get you a little bit situated in the Gulf states and uh, introduce the pre-oil era. And then we'll look at um, the post-oil boom time and then the age of urban spectacles and speculative urbanism. And then what preliminary evidence I have of how uh, a more, more moderate practices of Islam are being embraced. Uh, and then finally, we'll look at a few ways in which um, some conservative states have constructed liberal enclaves. Oops. Okay, so I'm thinking back, you know, 200 years ago, what was going on in the Gulf states? It was very different from today. Um, it was not urbanized largely. Uh, and before the discovery and profitability of oil, the economy in the Gulf region was based on largely three trade items, horses, dates, and pearls. And so the pearling industry was the most lucrative by far, and most uh, adult men were involved in this uh, as a seasonal uh, occupation. And these are the kinds of images that you uh, see from old photography from the Gulf states. It's people traveling on camels and the vast open desert. Um, and people were more nomadic. Um, and the states hadn't yet formed. And so we don't see the same state boundaries as we see today. Um, and so my research is focused on the Gulf Cooperation um, Council, GCC states, which are six countries that together have 45% of the world's proven oil reserves. And uh, they co together constitute about 25% of crude oil exports. So the post oil boom time was a game changer um, for these states. Oil was first discovered in the east coast of Saudi Arabia, of what is now Saudi Arabia. Um, and rapid changes happened in the subsequent decades. And so oil installations, um, housing, uh, roads, infrastructure, airports, everything was done uh, very rapidly after oil was became profitable. So what we're looking at here is the uh, 1951 Trans-Arabian -Ara Pipeline. And this sped up um, oil exports to 500,000 barrels of oil uh, per day. Uh, and just to put it in historical perspective, today, uh, Saudi Arabia exports uh, 10 million barrels of oil per day. And this has brought uh, unprecedented changes to um, the Gulf states. So uh, new types of housing, um, new types of mobility and possessions. Um, within just a few generations, life completely changed. And so rapid urbanization, kind of on an unprecedented scale, fueled by oil profits, we saw highways being built everywhere, modern skyscrapers and stadiums, uh, airports, etc. And the cities of the Gulf transformed into rec unrecognizable um, modern cities. Um, what we don't often hear about Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states is that uh, huge social gains were made during this period. And for example, literacy in Saudi Arabia 
went from about 4% uh, at the discovery of oil um, for, for women until uh, it, today it's about 97 or 98%. It's about, about 100% for the young generation. Um, and at the same time, these are still very conservative Muslim societies. Uh, and this is a photo I took on the streets of Saudi Arabia. And this is what a typical woman wears in many of the Gulf states. Um, and the rules are extremely strict for the types of behavior you can engage in in public. And so all these rapid changes, uh, but still a lot of continuity with the past in terms of religion. Um, Saudi Arabia is the most conservative of all, and up until very recently, that some there have been some recent changes. Um, gender segregation was practiced in public and private, and women had to be accompanied by a mahram or male fa uh, family member or husband in public. So you can see at this little juice stall, um, there's a, a line for men and a line for women, and this is the same in cafes and uh, any kind of. Um, food and beverage industry. Um, this is also an, a region of really uh, challenging demographics, uh, uh, economic changes and social challenges. There's a large foreign worker population. Um, and a lot of these foreign workers are doing sort of the dirty and dangerous jobs that locals don't wanna do. Um, but the numbers are staggering. Um, in Saudi Arabia, out of 30 million people, nearly one third are foreign workers and they constitute over half of the workforce. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, these numbers are more like 80% are foreign. Um, it's a quite young region, 60% of the population is under 21. Um, there's fairly high national unemployment and high youth unemployment. Um, there's corruption, um, a lot of bureaucracy, um, uh, a lack of innovation in some ways among the local population. They're sort of relaxing and enjoying the oil uh, <laughs> wealth uh, without actually innovating at this moment, uh, although this is changing. Um, very little freedom of the press, depends on the country. Uh, Kuwait might be the exception there. Uh, and there are quite harsh punishments for those who dissent. Um, and I want to just emphasize that the population is very uh, diverse and varied. Uh, so there are everywhere from fundamentalist Muslims to extreme liberal, progressive liberals, and everything in between. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's autocratic rule with zero representation in most contexts. So we've entered the age of urban spectacles and speculative urbanism in the Gulf. And we're seeing the oil, the profits from oil uh, leading to unprecedented urbanization. And part of this urbanization has to do uh, with uh, various economic diversification strategies. So the idea is to increase downstream oil industries, things like petrochemicals and plastics, uh, expand and improve education, develop a knowledge economy, um, develop tourism as a lucrative industry, um, and improve efficiencies in the economy and the country in general. Um, and so various mega projects are being constructed to support these strategies and the um, future, the post-oil future. So things like uh, high-speed rail, city metro systems, the first co-ed university in this, the Saudi Arabia and new cities. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of these urban spectacles um, and some of the development logic behind them. So first of all, I have some quotes because I have done research in the Gulf uh, in the past. And these are all quotes that sort of show how urgent change is desired. So for example, we need to adapt immediately. It's sink or swim. Look, we know the oil won't last forever. We need to diversify and develop a knowledge economy. We need to look to the future, not the past. Uh, we need to join the global community and open our doors to the world. Um, we need to be smart and sustainable. It's the only way forward. So some of the urban megadevelopments and spectacles we see are um, 
you can see in the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, this is currently the world's tallest building. Um, not for long, because I think there's some competition coming up uh, in other projects. Um, all sorts of sports infrastructure is underway right now, particularly in Qatar, which is hosting the FIFA World Cup uh, in 2022. So they've been building stadiums around the country, uh, including this uh, Lucille Stadium, which is the main stadium to host the World Cup. And this is where the final will be played. Uh, uh, museum infrastructure is another attempt to diversify the economy away from oil. Um, so hosting global tourists who are interested in cultural tourism and the arts. So the Louvre Abu Dhabi, I was just there. This is the last place I went before the pandemic. So uh, yeah, it was fun to go through these pictures and remember what it was like before we were all wearing masks. <laughs> uh, this is the interior. It's flashy. It's ostentatious. It's expensive. They're hiring top architects or star architects, as we say, uh, to design these kind of um, urban spectacles that will wow the world and basically put these, these cities in the Gulf on the map, so to speak. Uh, another fascinating project is the Hariman um, high-speed rail, which is a, a high-speed rail that connects Medina, um, King Abdullah Economic City, which is a new city uh, under construction, Mecca and Jeddah. So this is quite fascinating. The transportation dimension of, um, of this project uh, has no explicit feminist agenda, but Greater mobility will really help women who are currently trapped in a very restrictive society and the vast majority still don't have driver's licenses. And it was only legalized uh, for women to get a driver's license in recent years. So this, the um, metro, the stations on this um, high-speed rail network are fantastical. Um, there seems to be no budget, budget limitations. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're really kind of urban spectacles that uh, are going to be fascinating to study in years to come. Um, another transportation related mega project is the Riyadh Metro. Um, Riyadh is going from having no public transportation system to having the largest and most expensive metro system in the world. So it's costing about $23 billion. It's uh, in its final stages um, and it will really improve mobility for women, although this is not mentioned um, officially. Um, the King Abdullah Financial District Metro Station is designed by Zaha Hadid, who um, was a, a global star architect that, who passed away recently. But they're going for the best, you know, this is really projecting um, an uh, an image of modernity and progress and progressive thinking. Yeah, this is the interior. So it, it's, it's intended to have a wow factor and be, you know, one of engage in leading edge design. We are, we are also entering the age of new cities. And this is sort of the focus of my research. Um, where new cities are being built from scratch around the world, including in the Gulf states. So this is an image of one of the more fantastical projects in Saudi Arabia. So at least 28 new cities are being constructed from scratch in Gulf states. And these will require several trillion dollars to complete and could house over 15 million people um, if they're completed as predicted. So even Little Kuwait has 12, um, Saudi Arabia has seven. Look at ba Little Bahrain is planning five um, and so on. And so this takes place in a broader world of new cities where 150 new city projects uh, or more are being constructed worldwide in over 45 countries. Um, and these could house over 45 million if they are completed as planned. And so these new cities are seen as economic development strategies um, by countries, particularly in the global south and emerging economies. So some of these um, underway in the Gulf include Mazdar in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And this was intended to be the first carbon neutral city in the world. 
So they're trying to generate all the power um, needed for the project on site. Um, there was to be no cars in the city. It's sort of this dense walkable environment um, inspired by the dense urban urbanism of Arab cities. Um, and kind of the opposite of that is Sabah al Ahmed Sea City in Kuwait, which is a fascinating project I had the opportunity to visit also just before the pandemic. Uh, this city, it tunnels into the land to make canals six miles inland. So everyone has waterfront property. <laughs> it's very flashy and ostentatious and mainly uh, being used for uh, second homes for people who live in Kuwait City. So this is the project. Um, it's just beachfront everywhere you look. It's still underway. Uh, and this is a famous project in Dubai that many of you might have heard of, the Palm Jumeirah. Um, and again, it's, it's luxury real estate on artificial land. It's very um, identifiable. It has its own kind of brand and image. And yeah, it's very Dubai. <laughs> And then Lucille, which is a new city built to host the FIFA World Cup 2022. Um, and Qatar currently has something like 3 million foreign migrant laborers constructing a new metro, a new city, new stadiums, um, you know, the works. Um, it's showtime in December when the FIFA World Cup will be played. Uh, and then Neom in Saudi Arabia. Um, this is the largest project in the world. It's the, it will be the largest city built from scratch. The target population is 5 million. Uh, and it's high tech. It's, you know, completely a smart city in the middle of the desert. Um, it's supposed to be carbon neutral, neutral as well. And uh, we'll see how, how it turns out. <laughs> Um, so this is the pr proposed site of Neom, uh, the mega city. So it's a $500 billion project. Uh, it includes artificial rain, a fake moon, uh, holographic teachers. I mean, you name it, they have it. It's all very fantastical. Uh, and the site will be about 33 times the size of New York City. Um, and then this project was announced uh, just last year, and it's uh, the line. And this is what I mentioned earlier. It's a 170 kilometer long linear city. Um, and a train kind of connects both, both ends. And so there are no cars in the city. This is sort of the concept. Um, and a million people would live here, um, according to the plan. It would be 100% renewable energy. Um, and it would take 20 minutes to get from end to end. So it's sort of a high speed rail that connects all these nodes along the line. Um, and this idea, I mean, this is according to the rhetoric, 95% of nature would be protected based on this design. So just here's a little image of what they're conceptualizing here with these sort of uh, nodes of, of housing. Um, where everything's sort of a five minute walk away. Uh, and then these nodes are connected by train. So another um, major trend that's happening right now is embracing more moderate practices of Islam. And this is unprecedented. We're witnessing powerful figures in these Gulf countries challenging the conservative establishment publicly for the first time ever. Um, and so just a little run through of um, it, it, Saudi Arabia is the largest country in the GCC, and I've been there several times. And so uh, it, it provides a really insightful example of what's going on. Um, the late King Abdullah was seen as a force of modest liberalization. He was taking some baby steps towards liberalization. So uh, women were allowed to participate in municipal elections in 2015. Uh, he canceled things like lashings and other corporal punishments for women who were caught driving because driving was illegal. Um, he acknowledged publicly that women should be able to drive when society is ready. He wasn't willing to legalize uh, issuing driver's licenses to women, but he was um, open to the idea, let's say. <laughs> um, he saw there was a national imperative to increase employment among women. Uh, he saw this as kind of a business move. It makes economic sense to have full employment in your country, not just 
employment for 50% uh, of the population who happens to be male. Um, he, he saw opening up the Saudi economy and diversification as the way forward for the country. And so that really was agenda setting uh, and that's been carried on in the subsequent king and his son. He started an overseas education program and actually McGill is a beneficiary of this. We have many Saudi students uh, at McGill. Um, he created a new city. He created the first co-ed uh, university campus. He allowed some more open debate. And while he was king, Facebook and Twitter users kind of exploded in Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think Saudi Arabia is the one of the highest users of Facebook and Twitter and other social media. So he passed away uh, a few years back and then King Salman took over and the reforms kind of continued. Um, so women can now legally drive as of 2018. And his son, the crown prince, um, Mohammed bin Salman, called MBS in the media, he's made the boldest moves to uh, changing the laws to uh, allow women to participate more fully in society. So he has publicly stated that he wants to transform the kingdom to moderate Islam. Uh, and even introducing a new city with its own separate legal system to encourage um, more progressive um, thinking. So he has been quoted in the media in the last couple of years um, saying very bold statements to critique the Wahhabi establishment in Saudi Arabia. He says, we cannot grow, we cannot attract capital, we cannot have tourism, we cannot progress with such extremist thinking in Saudi Arabia. So this is, you know, a kind of a game changer. Um, other statements have come from the Crown Prince of Bahrain. He says the 17th century has no place in our modern 21st. Um, and I'm still doing research to gather other quotes. And I have um, an Arab uh, graduate student who's helping me go through Arab uh, press releases, uh, Arabic press releases and whatnot from other countries. Um, but this is just uh, new, you know, these kind of bold statements haven't been said uh, in the past. Um, and so the research I'm interested in is focusing on how liberal enclaves are being created in uh, these very conservative states. And so uh, I have examples that are kind of preliminary examples that I'm going to share, um, starting in Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait has uh, publicly stated that they would like to get people out of mosques and into other types of activities. And so the state has taken it upon itself to create some of these other activities. Uh, Kuwait is a really unique country in the Gulf because it is the most democratic. Um, it is, has the freest press. Um, it has an arts and theater scene. Uh, and so in a way it's, um, you know, an outlier in the Gulf. So the state created just in the last few years, three urban mega developments in Kuwait city intended to get people out of mosques and into other activities. The first one is a national theater complex called Sheikh Jabbar, Jabbar Al Ahmed Cultural Center. And this was finished in 2016. Um, Kuwait has the only theater scene in all of the Gulf. And it's a major cultural producer. So movies, um, TV shows, soap operas, lots of these things are produced in Kuwait and then exported to the other Gulf countries. And so this is a very bold statement in favor of growing the cultural industry of Kuwait. It's a really glamorous complex. The architecture is beautiful. People like coming here. It has sort of a, a park setting. It has cafes. Uh, it's very stylish and chic. So people come here, they get dressed up. It's a place to see and be seen. Um, the second uh, mega project um, is the Sheikh Abdullah Al Salam Cultural Center. And that was just finished in 2018. So I was there um, so soon after it was open. And it's a massive uh, museum complex with um, history, the arts, natural history, science, 
uh, etc all in one kind of massive campus so this is the largest museum complex um, in the gulf uh, and here's another view of it you can see there are sculptures it's all very you know engaging and you could go back again and again and sort of discover something new each time you go back uh, the, and then the third uh, project is the Al Shahid Park in Kuwait. Um, this provides a lot more public park space than what um, people in Kuwait City have had so far. It's a really beautiful, well-maintained linear park. Um, and you can see families out and about enjoying people jogging. You know, it's a really uh, dynamic, um, well-designed space. Um, and definitely fosters activities other than religious activities and that fulfills its objective. Um, it's also a, a really amazing night park. So people actually tend to go to parks at night in Kuwait just because it's so hot. So the lighting is really artistic and uh, beautiful. Okay, the second example is King Abdullah Economic City in Saudi Arabia. This is um, a city designed for 2 million people, the size of Washington, DC. And I've done fairly extensive research here. Um, so I'll elaborate a little bit on some of my findings. Um, the idea is that it will have jobs in all sorts of industries, uh, including the port, which will be the fifth largest in the world. So they're trying to create 1 million jobs in all sorts of industries from high tech, factories, business, education, uh, and attract domestic tourists by having a, a resort district. So what I realized after a number of visits there is they are an uh, aspiring hub of social liberalism. Um, doing interviews made me realize that there are economic objectives to this project. It's called King Abdullah Economic City for a reason. Um, but they ha are harboring sort of secret um, li social liberal goals of creating kind of a little oasis from the, the conservatives conservatism found in the rest of the country. So these are some of the quotes from upper management that I thought were particularly interesting. One of them said, you can wear a bikini on the beach, no one will stop you. This is illegal in Saudi Arabia. There's a photo of me doing field work here. Um, what I'm wearing is illegal to, be, to wear in Saudi Arabia. Um, everyone, all women have to wear a black robe um, called an abaya, which covers you, you know, from head to toe. Um, and that's not necessary in um, this kind of zone of exception. Um, Another quote, in 20 years, the rest of the country will be like this place. So a very aspirational quote that eventually the rest of the country will catch up to this kind of liberal oasis. Um, another one is women can do anything in cake. Um, King Abdullah Economic City, the acronym. Only women run the cake port. So at the time, workplaces were all segregated um, by gender. And they were having a really hard time with the control tower in the, the port. How do you segregate a control tower? It's like a, an airport control tower. How do you keep men and women separate when they have to be interacting to land the planes or dock the ships? And Saudi Arabia was not allowing them to have a mixed gender workplace. And so the management in Cake said, then fine, we'll have only women running the port. This is revolutionary for Saudi Arabia. Uh, what I also discovered is in a country that where alcohol is forbidden, there was a lot of alcohol in that town. <laughs> uh, and on more than one occasion, I heard I was offered cocktails um, in <laughs> in people's villas, which I definitely turned down because my your visa to get into Saudi Arabia says alcohol is forbidden. You will be uh, in big trouble, basically, <laughs> if you consume any. So my findings are that cake is actually quietly subversive. So they have these very public economic goals that they advertise and then very private social liberalization goals that they don't advertise so much. Um, and I found that the uh, city officials regularly break Saudi law and push the envelope. So for example, there was no gender segregation in the workplace in the planning office. Um, amplified pop music was banned in Saudi Arabia um, for many decades. 
and it was recently uh, made legal. But at the you know when it was still banned in Saudi Arabia, um, it was allowed in this city. Uh, there was public entertainment, which was also banned in Saudi Arabia at the time. Um, they were allowing Saudi women to wear different types of abayas in the workplace. So it didn't have to be black, which is the legal, <laughs> legally mandated color. Uh, it could, people were wearing like light blue abayas, which felt very subversive uh, at the time. And, and years before it was legal for women to drive the management of the city were allowing where they were issuing cars to women working in the planning office and you know IT and accounting and whatnot. Uh, and significantly, the management of the city negotiated uh, with the Saudi state that the religious police would be denied entry. And so it was a real attempt to create this sort of oasis um, from conservatism. So someone in the upper management told me, our goal is for this to be an open city. We want the people from the desert, as in the conservatives, to come in and to see what life can be like. It's our hope that they will realize it's a better way. So it's trying to be kind of an inspirational project um, for uh, re religious conservatives. At the same time, it's still a gated city with controlled access. So there are a lot of inconsistencies uh, to sort out. So let's move to Neom, which um, goes even further than King Abdullah Economic City in its goal to be a liberal oasis. Um, it's the largest uh, scale city to be built from scratch in history. Uh, and it aims to be uh, to create a gigantic zone for global activity and it will have a separate legal system from the rest of the country. So this is something that King Abdullah Economic City was never able to do. But MBS has introduced this project, it's his legacy project. And so he's very enthusiastic about um, the, having a separate legal system that is much more liberal than the rest of the country. It will be the only place in the kingdom where alcohol is legal. Um, I'll believe it when I see it, but anyway, that's the that's the official word. Um, it's the only place in Saudi Arabia where women may wear bathing suits on the beach, and it aims to attract a global um, cosmopolitan population and make them feel safe from the conservative laws and society of Saudi Arabia. The MBS claims this is going to be a city like a playground, so uh, lots and lots of uh, interesting architecture and experiences. Let's see how much of this actually gets built. These are computer generated models of what the city could look like. This is sort of the fantasy of um, designers rather than any practical plan for the development of this project. It's a very harsh desert environment. And so they, it's, you know, it's a challenging place to build. So there's a recreational dimension to this, a sort of, this is a, a little segment of the project that will be for rock climbing. You know, it's all kind of a fantasy at this point. And then finally, uh, Oxagon is, has been announced a few weeks ago, um, and that's the seventh new city project in Saudi Arabia. It's uh, intended to be a floating city uh, with eight sides. Um, and it remains to be seen um, if this is a liberal enclave, it hasn't really been announced, but I'm keeping my eye on this and I'm waiting to hear if any kind of city charter or parallel legal system is uh, announced. And the same goes for Durat al Bahrain in Bahrain. This is a project I'm watching carefully. It sort of sprung up out of nowhere and it's a series of artificial islands shaped like fish. Um, and it's sort of for elites because if you zoom in on Google Earth, you can see kind of little McMansions on the beach with swimming pools and whatnot. So I'm wondering if this is going to be another um, elite on uh, sort of a liberal enclave as well. Oops. Okay, so I have two years uh, on my grant, and I'm going to summarize my research questions moving forward. And I'm very open to ideas and suggestions, so I'll leave my email at the end of the presentation. How are city-centric development approaches instrumental in helping Gulf states to carve out spaces to accommodate more moderate practices of Islam? How are religion, state economic development, and speculative urbanism in the form of new city projects intertwined? 
And how does the current push to diversify away from oil take the form of city-centric development schemes? And how do these schemes dovetail with goals to address fundamentalism? Okay, and again, thinking of sort of the time dimension, I found this amazing quote from the Emir of Dubai that really puts this, uh, the, the context of the Gulf, Gulf's rise uh, to being a wealthy region in perspective. My grandfather rode a camel, my father rode a camel, I drive a Mercedes, my son drives a Land Rover, his son will drive a Land Rover, but his son will ride a camel. So we're coming back full circle um, and we'll see what happens in the decades to come. I think a lot more change will happen in my lifetime. Thank you very much. Um, uh, here's my email if anyone has questions or comments and we have time for some um, discussion now with um, our moderators, Jenny and Natalia. Thank you, Dr. Moser. Who are the major international investors that are supporting and are helping fund these projects? Are they state actors or large corporations? That's a great question. Um, these are largely state-driven projects, although corporations are helping develop them in public-private partnerships. So they're really complicated arrangements between uh, the state and private corporations. And it's leading to all sorts of fascinating um, developments. So for example, um, King Abdullah Economic City is being developed by a corporation that uh, is, was formed specifically to develop that city. And the corporation is listed on the Saudi Stock Exchange. Uh, and so we're seeing corporate, the corporatization of urban space at an unprecedented scale. Uh, and this, this means when a city is listed on a stock exchange, uh, if I buy stock, do I have more say over what happens in that city than residents themselves? So these are unanswered questions, but they're kind of red flags for uh, democracy, <laughs> any potential of democracy. Um, kind of going off of that question um, about um, kind of reliance on investment, have these countries succeeded in diversifying their economies more? As you pointed out in your presentation, there's been a lot of new develop developments. Would you term those successful in diversifying away from oil? You know, it's kind of too soon to say fully. Um, we're in this really early stages of creating these projects to help transition the economies away from oil. So for example, like Kuwait's 12 new cities, those are just announced, you know, some of them only exist in PowerPoint slides. I call them PowerPoint cities. Um, I think Bahrain is a country to watch because some people have said it's the first post oil or gas country in the Gulf. Uh, and Bahrain is where you know, Saudis go to vacation because it's a bit more relaxed, <laughs> a little bit more liberal. Um, but no one else is really making that much headway. Um, tourism is still a very low percentage of, you know, GDPs. Other, they're not really manufacturing hubs. The knowledge economy is still in its um, early, for, early years. Um, and even education rates, um, you know, literacy is very high now, and many people have undergraduate degrees, but they don't have, they're, they're less of the population has higher degrees. So it's still a game of catch up. But this is seen as basically a, a period of national survival is ahead, and they have to change or that's it. So everywhere I hear from every country, there are very kind of worried statements about what we have to do. So the moves are very bold, whether they can successfully trans transition the economy uh, in time for peak oil? That's the question. Are there any kinds of development controls on all the new construction projects, like any environmental impact assessments? Um, I noticed that a lot of these are on coasts that could potentially be affected by climate change. Um, well, the cynic in me says, no, there aren't <laughs> environmental controls, but I think they are talking more about environmental impact. I think there's a sort of general view that it's just a bunch of desert. Like who cares what in impact it has on the environment? Um, although the, I think the conversation is getting more sort of nuanced. 
Um, but when I visit these cities, at least the ones that have uh, been started and have like a, a population, uh, they require a lot of water. Um, they have beautiful green lawns, they have beautiful trees. All of that water comes from desalination. And desalination is an incredibly energy intensive way to purify water. And what energy do they have to use to extract the salt and minerals from water? Oil. And so they're going through unprecedented amounts of oil in order to make drinkable water and, and you know, fresh water. So they're not eco by many definitions. Um, and you point to, you made a good point about the climate change um, and sort of adaptation strategies for many of these cities that are built at sea level or on the sea itself. Uh, if sea level, if sea levels are supposed to rise by like three feet in the next 50 years or something, um, there could be uh, a lot more vulnerability created in a lot of these new cities. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg because um, I have a database of over 150 new cities. And I realized that between 35 and 40% of all new cities are at sea level or on the sea. <laughs> And so we may be solving some problems like housing crises and a lot of urban challenges that we face, but we may be manufacturing new types of vulnerabilities in generations to come. Um, how is national identity affected by these projects due to kind of these different identities forming in these specific cities outside of the rest of the country? Um, these are definitely nation building projects like these are state projects from countries that have gotten rich very quickly uh, and they they have uh, i could say in the arab world the gulf states might have a bit of a inferiority complex in terms of culture they're not part of the great islamic civilizations the ottoman empire or you know these 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 kind of big empires in sort of central regions of Islam. Uh, and so they're seen as sort of nouveau riche, you know, that are kind of like flashy and tacky. Uh, and they want to change the conversation away from oil wealth uh, and all of that, um, you know, very autocratic uh, royal royalty and oil wealth. And so I think this, these are conversation changers for sure. Um, like Mazdar trying to be the first carbon neutral city in the world. It got the world talking and they successfully did change the conversation away from oil. Um, despite the fact that Abu Dhabi has about 8% of the world's known oil reserves, um, a UN sort of sustainability agency has opened up in Mazdar. Um, and that was a huge source of pride for uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, and a lot of these, are, they're, they're very proud to be number one, like the tallest building in the world. It's a, a real source of pride. Um, and having all these new cities, um, it shows they can do it. They have the engineering capability to do it. They have the designers. Um, yeah, it's, it shows amazing technical ability and vision, which is exactly what they're trying to communicate to everyone. Is fundamentalism related to social inequalities? If so, could these new cities hinder efforts to curb fundamentalism by exacerbating segregation and social inequalities between privileged and underprivileged portions of the regional population? Oh, it's an interesting question. You know, the fundamentalism and the more conservative interpretations of Islam they're not tied to any class. And so you find poor people who are very, take a very conservative approach to Islam. And you find members of the royal families who are. And so it makes it really complicated to come to any kind of consensus if the leaders themselves occupy every position along the religious spectrum. Uh, and so within the House of Saud, um, that runs Saudi Arabia, you find every position um, from the very far conservative to extremely progressive. Um, uh, and so I think that there could be segregation based on, um, yeah, your sort of 
religious values um, in some of these cities. It, it's sort of an interesting thought exercise to think through what would actually happen if we did have these functioning liberal enclaves um, that have access to maybe more functioning liberal legal systems, less, less corporal punishment and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and so, yeah, you could be, I guess, legally disadvantaged if you live outside of those zones. Uh, for example, if you're a woman and you still face corporal punishment for doing something for kissing someone in public or something like this, whereas you could do it if you're in this liberal enclave. And so there is a potential injustice there. Um, but my understanding of these projects is that they're almost like test, test grounds it's easier to have a, a, an oasis of liberalism than to change the entire legal system of a country. And so if they have these little oases that seem to be functioning and working, I think the idea is that they'll spread this to the rest of uh, the country. And so that, when I was doing interviews in King Abdullah Economic City, they absolutely felt that. They thought that there was sort of this magical thinking that we'll create the best city will show it off to everyone and they'll be really inspired to change their ways. Um, and so it was more sort of moderate Muslims and even secular people in Saudi Arabia who were pushing this project and believing that maybe they can just change the minds of the conservatives through seducing them with this beautiful city. Um, and that remains to be seen. Maybe that will happen. Um, maybe it won't. Um, a lot of these um, really conservative people haven't traveled anywhere else and they don't really know what other places are like. And so if they're not leaving the country, maybe going into these liberal zones for a little staycation might change their minds. But it seems a bit like magical thinking to me. Um, going off your point about um, kind of like international education, are a lot of these leaders of these new liberal cities educated or influenced by the West? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are, uh, well, aside from MBS, um, I mean, the, the corporate management is very global uh, and cosmopolitan. So like the former CEO of King Abdullah Economic City, who I've interviewed a few times, he went to Stanford, you know, he's just as comfortable in Saudi dress as he is in an Armani suit. So these are people who can travel very well between cultures and they definitely want to embrace something completely different than what's been the norm in previous decades in terms of conservatism. And they absolutely are liberal in the sense that they drink. They, you know, I think they're very different people when they leave Saudi Arabia and then when they come back, it's a little bit of a different situation. But even if you're rich in Saudi Arabia, you can find ways to get alcohol. And so that's that's who is providing, you know, all these cocktails and stuff in a dry country. Is there any poverty in any of these centers that you saw? Well, uh, in Saudi Arabia, it's a very different story than the rest of um, the Gulf, with the exception of, I think, Bahrain. Um, oil wealth is not distributed that equitably, and it's also a huge, huge society with, you know, tens of millions of people. Um, but so there are poor people in Saudi Arabia, and they work very modest jobs, or they're unemployed or whatever. And you compare that with like Qatar and Abu Dhabi, and the state actually cuts people checks from time to time of like a million dollars. And so they share, they have very small populations like Qatar and uh, Abu Dhabi, they only have several hundred thousand uh, citizens. And so they share wealth and everyone's wealthy without having to do that much work. Um, but it's a really different story in Saudi Arabia. And so the potential for unrest in Saudi Arabia is also a lot higher. Uh, and so there was actually unrest in Bahrain. That was probably the country in the Gulf that had the biggest unrest during the Arab Spring. Um, there were riots, uh, people died, people really angry that they were not getting their share of the pie they were you know there's a housing crisis they felt like they couldn't make it um, and so after the arab spring bahrain has been actually very active in building public housing which is the only place i'm aware of in the gulf that does that so i guess ironically the public housing is on reclaimed land so <laughs> i don't know how long it's going to last if the sea level rises 
Um, but the whole coastline of Bahrain is changing. And I think part of it might be attributed to um, well, the rise of, you know, global elites who own multiple houses around the world and, you know, local elites, um, but also the demand for housing from the middle and lower classes. Um, so that's one to watch out for because the entire coastline is changing right before your eyes. So I, I go to Google Earth and watch new islands being created, <laughs> you know, regularly. But the kind of class issues are really interesting to drill into. And I'd like to explore that a little bit more in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia um, and how this connects to um, conservative Islam or liberal Islam and how it connects to city building. So there's a ton more research to be done. Um, so I'm planning to go to the Gulf in December this year. I haven't been able to go for so long because of COVID, um, but that's the plan. Um, and I can do some interviews and, you know, get a better sense of it. Um, you touched on this a bit, but what is the largely domestic population's response to these new cities, specifically outside of the cities themselves? Like what are um, like more rural um, or just outside of the cities um, responses to the construction and, and the pathway that the countries are seeming to take? Um, yeah, that's a good question that I think we would need to kind of quantify more. I can give you kind of my first impressions of the buzz maybe that they're creating. They're fairly heavily advertised just because these are state priority projects. A, there's a lot of money going into them and they're really glamorous. So uh, Lucille in Qatar, you know, hosting the FIFA World Cup 2022. It's a real source of pride to have snagged this glamorous event. Um, and people are really proud of the new metro system. It suddenly feels like Doha is a global city. Um, so it ranges from that, a, a real excitement and pride, to disappointment, uh, because a lot of these projects haven't happened as planned. And so, for example, in Mazdar and King Abdullah Economic City, um, people who bought condo units or houses they said, you said the city would be finished by now and th there's only five, six, 7,000 residents. And so there, there is disappointment. And then on the extreme end, some residents have been extremely angry by being displaced by these projects and they don't wanna give up their territory, their land, their ancestral homeland. So this came to a head recently when a tribal leader who was very critical of Neom was murdered by the state. So the Saudis aren't playing around. <laughs> Um, what will you what will religious practices look like and how will it change for the everyday person? Um, or do you expect religious practices to change between the oasis cities compared to other cities? Um, it's a region in so much flux right now. Um, it's hard to say kind of generally. Like Kuwait has always been the more liberal country. And we're seeing signs that it's actually slipping into more conservatism right now, despite the fact that they've done this sort of building campaign. Um, for example, they just banned women from doing yoga um, in the desert specifically. Um, but religious practices in Saudi Arabia, um, the crown prince, MBS, has actually forbidden a lot of extreme uh, practices of Islam, and he's getting very involved in sort of managing the practice of Islam. So he's very powerful, as we all know, he can have people executed, uh, if that's what he wants to do. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, so, the, so just one final anecdote, um, because I think we have to wrap up. Um, the co-ed university in Saudi Arabia, which is the first and only co-ed university, um, it faced a lot of criticism from conservatives um, who said, how can we have this uh, violation of Islam on the holy land where Islam was founded? Uh, and he is a famous imam who is on the radio. He has a radio show and he disappeared. So there, the warning shots are fired uh, and MBS isn't playing around. And if you critique these projects too much, you're, you're in for it. So I don't know, I, I'd have to, you know, be there and sort of sniff around a little bit more to see to what extent there's a chill going through um, conservative society. 
Wow, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. What an eye-opener to an interesting part of the world. Uh, uh, makes me want to go explore Google Earth now, for sure. <laughs> I get to officially thank you. You will be getting gifts from the Red Path Museum because that's where I work and that's the place that supplies um, this series. That makes sure that our speakers get to you, get to the ch YouTube channel. It will be preserved on YouTube. People will watch this um, forever. You get in internal mail. We'll be sending you your little um, stereoscopic postcard from the Red Path. So you get to put it up to your eye and you get to see that dinosaur in 3D. You will be getting a McGill outreach mask. Face Ooh, mask. Great. Thank you. The museum is closed, but you will be getting this gallery guide. I, I see it's mirrored now. Um, it is entitled Treasures from the Earth. So inside everything, our minerals galleries, we've you know, taken the pictures um, and published this wonderful gallery guide so you can pretend you're visiting the museum looking at the minerals. And a historical book, Tea and Fossils. It's a brief history of the museum. Thank you so much. Thank you to our student ambassadors, Jenny and Natalia, moderating the Q&A and introducing Sarah. Behind the scenes, Stuart McCombie, Fred Guichard helped with the uh, with the hosting responsibilities, the welcome and the land acknowledgement. We'll be back with you in a month's time, April 14th, same time, 6 o'clock on McGill's YouTube channel. We'll be hosting Professor John Sakata. He specializes in birdsong and he's going to be sharing with us his research and how he thinks there are parallels between what he's understanding about birdsong and how humans communicate. See you in about a month.